going to do with that Chad Dillahide. <laughs> He's one of a kind. Yeah, absolutely one of a kind. I, I have truly enjoyed the fellowship with him. I appreciate his influence and in helping me get the opportunity to meet this great church and its leadership and, and all the members. It's, it's really been, been wonderful. And, uh, it, and the food and everything has been wonderful. The sisters preparing all the food and then the afternoon meals and different one taking us out and, and you know and the day was uh, uh, was uh, especially good in that my old friend and associate in the gospel from way back brother Robert Woods he invited us out to Cracker Barrel and and he and I and Chad had a wonderful time together matter of fact uh, uh, I'm and Chad gonna hate to see this meeting close he's been to quite a few meals I had to get you, Chad. You get us through it. I had to get him. But uh, he is a superb, wonderful young man. And again, I appreciate it. Brother Woods, he's here with his lovely wife. And uh, it's just been great all the way down through. And I think, uh, is it Brother Gray? Is that right? That went to the throne of grace? I want to thank him for the prayer. And, and, and I tell you, Brother McDaniel, your singing, your leading has just been outstanding. This man knows how to sing. He knows how to build us up. And he's got this big screen. If you can't see it in your book, you can, you can see it on the screen. And, and I tell you, uh, some of those hymns that, 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 that I heard him lead us in, they just stir you up. In fact, every night, if you'll listen and sing, it will set you on fire. Matter of fact, if you come to this services and this singing doesn't set you on fire, all I can say is your wood must be wet. <laughs> but if it, it may be wet, I don't know. But great, Brother Daniel, it has been beautiful. You've done us a great job, and uh, I just thank God for this opportunity. Uh, we, we, we would hope that someone will respond to the gospel, uh, but uh, you never can tell what uh, God's word, it will not return to God void, empty, but it will accomplish that for which God sends it forth. The word of God is sent forth for a twofold purpose, to save those who will obey it and to condemn those who reject it. I think uh, I've heard our preachers uh, say this, that the word of God, the gospel is like a double barrel shotgun. And you know, if you get any kind of hunter at all and you go out hunting game and you got a double barrel shotgun, you most likely get it because if you miss it with one barrel, you get it with the other. And the gospel is double barrel. As Brother Keeble, I think, used to say that, it's double barrel. Salvation in one barrel, damnation in the other. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If one barrel doesn't get you, the other one will. We hope the salvation barrel, if there's someone here tonight, the salvation end of the thing will, will, will get you and that you will respond. We don't know who our artist is, but if there are those in here who have not yet obeyed the gospel of Christ, when we stand to sing the song of encouragement, I pray God that you will walk forward because whenever the song is sung and whenever the opportunity is granted, the angels of heaven are just waiting for the outcome. And if you respond to the gospel, the Bible teaches us uh, in one way that heaven rejoice. Heaven will have a party tonight. If one sinner repenteth, the 99 just person doesn't need no repentance. And if you're in the church and you haven't been living as you should, you need to rededicate your life to Christ. And really mean it. And if you really mean it, uh, then uh, what the damage you may have done by not being faithful and people seeing you do things that is unbecoming to the Christian, if you be faithful after this, then they will see in time that you've changed. And then your influence will be of such that you might be lead, able to lead someone to Christ. As we are saying, this is our last night of the meeting. And I hope that this lesson will be plain enough for everybody to understand it. We always try to have our lesson down low enough where everybody can sob. We don't want nobody to miss any of it. And uh, so uh, I was thinking about several things that I needed to point out in the meeting. And this is good for those 
uh, naturally for our main interest of those who are not members of the Church of Christ, but this is also good for those who are in the church uh, in case you would like to uh, be able to go to your friends and neighbors and, 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 you know, and repeat the things that you've heard us preach. It's not everybody that you can repeat their lessons, can repeat their lessons. I remember on one occasion said one, one brother, he, that's the kind of brothers that just come out for a show. They never learn how to really do anything. They just there looking, looking good, but they, they, you call on them to lead a prayer or something, they just almost faint. Well, they call on this brother to lead a, a, a prayer. And you talking about making a mess of trying to lead that prayer. And he was saying this and he couldn't get it together. And he asked the brother next to him, said, will you finish this prayer for me? He said, I can't finish that, I'll start another one. <laughs> and so, not that prayer. And so we, we better get on into our lesson for consideration tonight. And uh, I thought that my subject would be uh, about uh, something quite serious, very, very serious. I want to talk about some Judgment Day surprises. Some Judgment Day surprises. All of us like surprises, especially if they are good ones. But every now and then we get a bad one, and we don't enjoy it. And, but I'm going to talk about uh, some Judgment Day surprises. And uh, unfortunately, or unfortunately, which is the way you want to take it, uh, these surprises uh, will not be so pleasant. But it's better to find out now than wait till the judgment to find out what's going to happen to some people. If you uh, listen to us and you discover that you're guilty uh, of some of the things that I'm going to bring out, then you certainly need to listen close to us uh, about uh, these Judgment Day surprises. Uh, Jesus uh, talked about them, and there's so many of them, I'm going to try to zero in on a few key ones uh, in order that you might listen up and get some serious attention uh, uh, to the lesson that we have for you tonight. I think you remember uh, the, the, what the scripture said about what has happened in the old world when the world was once destroyed, and you know, in the days of Noah, and Noah preached, I think, for about 120 years. I think Brother Alan Webster said, said it was uh, the longest sermon ever preached. Is that right? And it, it was technically the same sermon for about 20, 120 years. He pleaded and begged, and, and, but the people rejected him. He was a preacher. He was a preacher of righteousness. Uh, but we know that in the day of the flood, the people were so hard-hearted that they rejected the preaching of Noah, and then the flood was on them. Jesus brought it up, he mentioned it uh, when he came on the scene and talked about uh, uh, how that uh, the people were marrying and giving in marriage and all of this and didn't realize it till the flood came and took them away. It came upon them and the reason it was surprising to them is because it's like a lot of people today, they don't put much stock in what the Bible said. They are so worldly minded, they just don't have their minds on the Bible. And, and a lot of time, especially the unbelievers and those who lean toward infidelity, ah, ain't nothing to that. That's, that's just some old talk. There ain't no, ain't no such thing as no judgment. When a man's dead, he's done and it's all over with. And all this kind of thing. But those kind of people, they're going to be shocked because one of these days, the judgment is coming. We don't know when, but it's coming. And when it comes, it's going to catch, Jesus says it's going to catch a lot of people just like it caught them in the days of Noah. It looked like with all that evidence in the Bible about what happened, how the people were then, and what happened to them, that people would be kind of, uh, you know, watching out. But they act like that never had happened. Uh, but there's going to be some surprises in the day of judgment. And I mean, it's, and I can't tell you about all of them, but I'll tell you about some of them. I want to build an argument here. I have several scriptures. Go to run over there, brothers, and, and get me. Go to the book of Matthew, uh, the seventh chapter, uh, uh, and also go to Luke, the thirteenth chapter. Maybe several of your brothers hold that for me. Matthew thirteen, uh, and uh, we 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 we're, we're going to talk about something uh, that uh, uh, that you need to know about because it's going to be uh, some great surprises in the day of judgment for some people. And I don't want you to be surprised because it's going to be a very unpleasant one, very much so, a deadly one, a one that you'll regret for eternity. And you don't want this thing to happen to you. 
And Jesus, he, he talked about it, Matthew 7, I believe it is. And uh, I know that the 23rd verse, for sure, I know that he said something there. And uh, if one of you brothers might read that, and I'll just do a little comment around it, so we won't have to read all of the verses. But uh, Matthew 7, 23, just read that verse. What will I confess unto them? I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart, from me, Dep that work Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This was the incident where uh, the people that said came to Christ and they began to talk to him, said, Lord, uh, we've done wonderful works in your name. In your name we prophesied. In your name we've cast out devils. Oh, they just telling Christ what all they had done for him. And Jesus shot them. He surprised them by making a charge against them that they perhaps were not expecting and might not have really fully understood what the charge was. Uh, but when they talked about we've done wonderful works in your name, we've cast out devils in your name, he said, and then I will profess unto them, depart from you. I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. I never recognized you. Uh, and of course, uh, that was a shocking thing for him to say to them and because uh, uh, something was going on in their lives that they just thought for sure we've been working for the Lord just like a lot of people in the, the, the denominational world is, is, is full of this. It's got some of the finest people you ever want to meet that's members of various denominational churches and those folk are working and they're working and they think they're working for the Lord. And, and that's the kind of people here that Jesus reminds us of in Matthew 7. And then there's another one in Luke 13 chapter. Uh, uh, and at, at that final verse, at the 27th verse, somebody had asked the question, are there few that be saved? And of course, Jesus said, to strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many will seek to enter, but they will not be able. They're, they're going to be wanting to come in but they will not be able. And in that 27 verse, for sake of time, what did he say, Luke 13, 27? All right, read that. Say, I'll say what? Say, read. I'll tell you. I, tell you, I know you not. I don't know which you are. Read on. What's that? Depart from me. That's it. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Now, the uh, reason we're not giving all all the, uh, the details of the verse because I'm after one thing because all three of these incidents that Jesus calls our attention to there's one word that kept popping up now look at the 13th chapter of Matthew and about the 41st verse this is another uh, incident telling about how it's going to be at the end of the world at the end of time and what does he say there all right Matthew 13 41 and the Son of Man, he's going to send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that cause stumbling. Read, and, and, and that's very important. I didn't quite hear that last part. And them that do iniquity. Now, this is what is interesting. Uh, all three of these cases that Jesus mentioned, at the end of it, he was telling them, depart from me. I never knew you. I don't know who you are. And then at the end, he said, depart ye that work iniquity. Iniquity. And a lot of people then maybe, and I know now, don't even know what iniquity is. But iniquity is so bad. Jesus said, he goes, said to them, uh, depart from me. I never knew you. In other words, iniquity is so bad that if you are caught in the judgment with iniquity in your life, he would be telling you, get out of my sight. Depart from me. And that, uh, you know, a, a rank sinner, a worldly person might could understand, well, I've been awfully bad. I know uh, I, know I should have done change, but no one he's getting on me hard. But these people in these cases, were honest, seemed like sincere people who thought surely that they had been working for the Lord. Just like we may have here tonight, some are sincerely working in your churches, doing various things, and you feel like, I'm working for the Lord. Well, these people were like that. But when Jesus said to them, depart from me, I never knew you. 
In one incident, one of the cases, when Jesus said that, uh, I, I don't know, he, they said, well, you taught in our streets. We heard you preach. We ate and drank in your prayer. We ate with you, and you taught in our streets. They thought that because uh, that uh, they were uh, in the fellowship in that respect around Jesus, that that earned them some credit to being around him. But Jesus didn't come all the way from heaven just to eat with folk. Oh, no, 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 no. He didn't come there just to eat. He came down there for a main purpose, to seek and save those which were lost. And people who could not, could, 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 could not see what Jesus' purpose was, but then just thought that if they just have fellowship with him, eat with him and drink with him. But they said that, and Jesus says, I tell you, I don't know you. But we, we heard you preach. I don't know you. And the main thing he said behind each one of these cases, you work in iniquity, depart from me, get out of my sight. You've been working iniquity. You know what? I don't know how much you all know about iniquity, but it must be pretty bad. Anything that will cause Christ and the judgment to break your heart. Especially you've been real working, think you're working for him, real religious. And even turn your back on a whole lot of that sinful stuff going on in the world. Just trying to pray. God. I go to church every Sunday. I do this and I do that. I'm trying to reach us. All you've been working, you say. And to hear Jesus say, depart from me. I never knew you. And ain't no need of you trying to make the Lord know you if he said he didn't know you. Because if he says he doesn't know you, ain't no need of saying, well, I know you, Lord. Let me give you an illustration now. I hope this illustration doesn't bother you. When Jesus said, I don't know you. Let's just say uh, I'm in, in pretty bad shape and about to lose my home and need about $2,000 right away. And I don't know anywhere I can go and get it. And I said, what can I do? And I get this crazy idea in my head. If I call the president, I believe I, he'll, he'll let me have it because I know he's got money. So I get on the phone and I call the president. And, you know, you can't hardly get through. But if I actually got through and said, hello, President speaking. President, this President Obama? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, President, I'm in trouble. I need $2,000. If I don't get it, I'm going to lose my home. And, 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 and I know you got it. And I just want it for a short time. And I'll send, you, send it right back to you as soon as possible. If you just let me have it, because I know you got it. But I'm doing all that talking. He's going to say, it's a who, who you say you are? I say, uh, this is Brinkley, Eddie Brinkley. He said, I don't think I know. I don't know you, Brinkley. I said, but look, I saw you on television. I heard you speak. I need the $2,000 bad, President. I need it bad. And, and, but but I, don't, I, I don't know you. Did you have two, I don't know who you are, but I know you. And uh, uh, hello, hello, President, hello. Are you there? No, you know you sure. I just said that. That's comical, but it won't be funny. You stand in the judgment and say, Lord, I worked down here on the earth for you. I sold more chicken than anybody else for you. I served the pastor. I did this, that for you, Lord. And he'll say, I never recognized you. I know you, Lord. I don't know you. And Jesus says he's going to say that to a lot of religious people, sincere religious people. I don't know you. And the thing that you can isolate, because in all three of these incidents, Matthew 7, 1 and Luke 13, and, and, and one in Matthew 13 about, I, 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 know, I know you're not, and, and, and he said at the end, you've been working iniquity. Anything that would cause the Lord to say, I know nothing about you, get out of my sight, and you're standing at the gym. I don't know you, away from me. And the reason that I'm not going to accept you, you've been working iniquity. That tells me this. Iniquity must be something mighty bad. And I'll say this before I explain to you fully what iniquity is. You may go up to the judgment with a whole lot of little things that you might think you can bargain with the Lord about. Lord, just give me a break, give me a chance. But I tell you one thing, don't you go up there with no iniquity. Is that right? That iniquity will ruin you. 
If you're sitting here tonight in, 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 in engulfed in iniquity, you better get rid of that iniquity. Because if you don't, Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. You've been working that. And Jesus can't stand iniquity. And these people that were being charged with being, having iniquity were sincere, honest, religious people. Working hard in their churches and trying to do all they could. And then got turned down according to it's going to be the scripture. And the thing that caused it was, I believe he said, iniquity. Let me see him. Guess this screen here is, chalk is here, okay. He said iniquity. Now y'all excuse my writing. N-I-Q-U-I-T-Y. There is it. If you don't want uh, to be surprised in the judgment with the Lord dropping this on you, you better look into this iniquity thing. Am I right? You see how bad it is, each case. Different situation, but when he got through, we done wonderful work in your name. We did this for you, Lord, we did that. You taught in our street, we heard you preaching all that. When they got through with all of that, Jesus said, I don't know you. Why? You've been working iniquity. Iniquity. Woo, iniquity must be mighty bad. And so I owe it to you to explain to you what iniquity is and show you how it works so that if you come here tonight and got any iniquity on you, you better get rid of it while you can. Am I right? Because in the judgment, it will ruin you. You say, well, well what is iniquity? Well, now, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know Greek. And uh, in the New Testament, it was written in Greek. So I, I learned that if you want to find out what something really is, a word, since the New Testament was written in Greek, if you get a Greek scholar, he can tell you what the word means. One of the great Greek scholars is W.E. Vine. He, in other words, he's not, uh, uh, he just knows the Greek original and he can tell you what it is. So uh, I, I'll share this with you, what he said iniquity is. He said, now, iniquity is ah, no, yam, mea. Now that's what iniquity is, it's ah, no, mea. Don't you go up to the judgment with no ah, no, mea. You say, well, wait a minute, Brother Brick, I didn't even know what iniquity is. You ain't, I'm just getting worse now. <laughs> well, sometimes the thing has to get worse before it gets better. So W.E. Vine said, iniquity, this thing that'll cause Jesus to get out of my sight. I don't know you. Depart from me. He, uh, Vine said, iniquity is anomia in the Greek. And then he explained this. He says, that nomia means number, I believe that is. No mia, no mia. And, and the A part of that, mean, mean, the no mia means number of the law. That's what no mia is, no more law. It's law. That's what the word means. They're like, you know, do the wrong no man, no more. The wrong no is the book of law. So no more, no, no mia means law. Well, what about the A in front of it? The A in front of it means without, without law. So iniquity means that you are trying to serve God without recognizing his law. Are you following me? All right, stay with me now. Anomia means, iniquity means anomia. Anomia means to work without law. And what law must we work with? If you expect to go up before Christ at the judgment and hear him tell you, well done, thy good and faithful servant, uh, then there is a law. I believe it's, a, it's Galatians 6, 5, if my memory is correct, uh, where Jesus says, bear ye one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Christ has a law. The New Testament has his law. And if you're going to be saved, you must submit to his law. You can't do whatever you want to do. You can't even do what your preacher says do. You got to do what Christ said do. If you don't do what he says, then you are in iniquity. Because anomia means without law, without the law of Christ. So don't you go to the judgment having done a lot of stuff that Christ didn't tell you to do. And to break it down a little bit more, anomia means without law. And when you're trying to operate and do stuff outside the law, that makes you an outlaw. Amen. 
Am I right about it? You're an outlaw. It's a whole lot of sensitive people going standing in the judgment, hoping the Lord say, well done. And they're standing up there outlaws. That's right. How did they get to be outlawed? Because the Jesus said they work in iniquity. And iniquity means outside of the law. What law? His law. The law of Christ. Let me show you. And we, we building up a little steam here now. You watch this. Since we know iniquity means operating outside of the law, and we know whose law that is, the law of Christ, we just let this circle represent the law of Christ. Anything that you're trying to do in religion that you can't find in his law, the New Testament, then whatever you're doing, that, that, that's outside of his law, and that's iniquity, and that makes you an outlaw. Now you're going up to the judge and think the Lord's going to say, well done, you're standing there an outlaw. Uh, oh yeah, I, I got you. Outlaws. To just say that without explaining it, you'd be insulted. Call me an outlaw. I'm serving the Lord. Well, Jesus called them outlaws. He said, you're working iniquity. Why call you Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? In other words, everywhere you go, if you're trying to be saved, get saved. You have to get saved within the authority of the law. The New Testament is his law. If you're going to get saved, you've got to get saved according to the law, the New Testament. Can't get outside the New Testament and try to get saved. Because whatever you do, if it's not in the New Testament, that's going to be iniquity. And you end up an outlaw. And the law will say, I don't know you. Depart from me. All right. Y'all looking real serious tonight. It is, it is real serious. You got to stay within the law. And guess what? Nearly everything that people are doing today, good old sincere religious people, and a lot of them preachers included, they're doing a whole lot of stuff and telling you to do, and they're doing it, but they can't find it within the law of Christ. Now, if you're doing stuff that's not within the law, that's throwing you to be an outlaw. Am I right? An outlaw not going to make it. You say, well, I never thought I'd be. That's what, that's what an outlaw is, one operating outside of the law. When it comes down to being saved, there's a lot of people tonight say, I'm saved, I got saved several years ago. And when you check into how you got saved, you can't find what you did nowhere within the law of Christ for you to do that. You say, well, I, 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 I heard uh, Joel Osteen some years back. Uh-oh, you're in trouble. Just name him now. He's like, Joel, Joel said, if you want to be saved, all you have to do is pray the sinner's prayer. And he even says, before I close, I always want to give the sinner a chance and pray the sinner's prayer. And says, and as a sinner, you just bow your head and pray with me. And Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I don't know exact words that he gave, but when you get through praying that, he says, I believe you've been born again. Nowhere does the scripture say you can pray yourself into a new birth. A sinner is not to approach God by prayer. You can't. As a matter of fact, prayer is for the righteous. It's when you become a Christian that God gives you the right to pray. You can't pray away your sins as a sinner. What did Peter say on the day of Pentecost when those people said, what must we do? Many of you read that. Peter got to preach and they said, what must we do? Did Peter say, where you bow your heads right there where you are and receive Jesus as your personal Savior. You're saved. He didn't say any such thing because all that's outlaw stuff. And if you believe it, when you get through doing it, it just make you a full fledged spiritual outlaw. And Jesus says, that's iniquity. And if he's iniquity, get out of my sight. Don't go up there with no iniquity. Oh, let's go on with this little father. So when it comes to being saved, the plan of salvation, what you did has to be within the law of Christ. You, you, you can't pray your way in. There are certain steps that you must take before you can get salvation. Prayer is for the righteous. I of the Lord over the righteous. His ear is open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And sometimes the, the uh, outlaw, he do some tricky stuff. And he make you think what he's saying is right. 
And he could be just as wrong. He could steal something and give you a story how old ain't so-and-so died and left me all of that. You have to check him out because he's a rascal. And there are preachers who are rascals who are working in the interest of Satan. And if you don't watch them, they'll have you doing stuff outside of the law of Christ. And, and, and one of the things that really gets me, now Saul of Tarsus was a chief of sinners. And how did he get rid of his sins? He did not pray them away. As a matter of fact, when he was, saw that light on the road and he fell to the ground and he said, Who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecuted. Jesus said, You go on down to Damascus and be told you what you must do. He was a sinner. He was a chief of sinner. And this is what the Lord told him to do. Go down there. Why? Because there'll be a man down there that has my law. And he'll tell you what to do according to my law. Because if Saul had done anything else, he couldn't have gotten rid of his sin. And so he went on down there. And for three days and three nights, he fasted and prayed. Now, where in the law of Christ did he tell Saul, a sinner, to pray for the pardon of your sin? That was outside of his law. Am I right? And he was down there outlawing, praying. Somebody said, well, 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 well what's wrong with praying? Prayer is the privilege of the righteous, and it is not something that you can get yourself into the church in by. You can't pray your way into Christ. And so when the preacher got to him, Saul was down praying. He was sincere. He was fasting. Went, hadn't eaten anything for three days and three nights. You're talking about a sincere man. That lick must have been pretty tough, brother. When he fell to the ground, he was praying, praying. And Jesus said, it'll be told you what you must do. Go down there. It'll be told you what to do. But I guess he was so uh, worked up, he didn't, he didn't check with what the Lord said. He just got down there and he started praying three days and three nights. And he didn't move a single sin with that. And I don't care how many of these preachers say you can pray your sins away. As a sinner, they're, they're wrong. That is iniquity. That is outside of the law of Christ. And so he prayed three days and three nights. And finally, when Ananias, the man of God, got to him. Had, saw him down praying. You can tell a true preacher of the gospel. He will not tell sinners that they can be saved by prayer. Because if he'd have been like some of these preachers, Saul was down praying. If he'd have been like a lot of these denominational preachers, he said, that's good for you, son. I'm glad you're down, Saul. Just stay on down there and pray until God for Christ's sake forgive you of your sin. Just stay down there. But he didn't tell him that. He saw him. He said, brother Saul, arise. Get up from there. And be baptized to wash away your sin. He couldn't pray away his sins. I don't care what Joel Osteen and those fellows say. Just pray the sinners. But you can't pray away your sin. You can't get rid of them. But the, if you pray them away, you don't really get rid of them. You're just operating outside of the law of Christ. Sinners praying outside of the law of Christ. What are you when you're outside of the law of Christ? You are in iniquity. What is iniquity? Operating outside of the law. You see, you see, I'm trying to get you to see this. And so he said, get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, call it on the name of the Lord. And you know, somebody has said, those nominated preachers sometimes are pretty sharp. They said, well, didn't Paul say, whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved if you call on. Now, the calling that the Bible teaches about is not praying. Because Saul was doing that. And he didn't mean to move a single sin by praying. Calling uh, it meant obeying because when Saul Ananias told him, say, arise, get up from there, be baptized, wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Calling there is a commentary. When you arise and you be baptized to get your sins washed away, that's the kind of calling that God is talking about. It's really obeying. So I know some of this is sometimes people say, well, our pastor said, Paul said, if you call on the Lord, you shall be saved. Well, look, I know when Paul said that in Romans 10, he was not talking about praying. Well, why would you say it? Back to my lesson last night. Because common sense won't let me believe that when he said, if you believe on the Lord, Jesus Christ, you should be, you know, if you whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, that that meant praying. You know why I know that didn't mean praying? And when pa Paul said that, because he had already tried that. Is that right? Three days and three nights. How many sins did he get moved? Not a one. 
I do not believe Paul would treat people like that. What would you think about it if you said, Brother Brinkley, I have arthritis in my knee. It's so bad. And I said, well, i tell you what you do. I name certain kind of cream. You can get it at the drugstore. You get that and you rub with that. And I believe you'll be all right. And that sounds good, doesn't it? And he said, of course, I got, I got some, but, and, but, it, 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 but it didn't help me, but it might help you. Oh, man, God, shoot. What? That's what Paul would have to be engaged in, that kind of foolishness. If when Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I should be saved. If he was talking about praying, he was advising people to do what didn't help him. He tried that. He prayed three days and three nights and didn't meet, move a single sin. He didn't, wasn't, they wasn't moving until he arose and was baptized in water to wash his sins away. I don't have the time to name all the different schemes that men use. If you claim you got saved, you better be able to go to the scriptures and show where the Lord told you to do that. And not some tricky thing. Because everything that he would have you to do is within his law. You get caught out here, that's iniquity. Everything outside of the law of Christ is iniquity. And iniquity will cause the Lord to say, I don't know you. So when it comes down to getting rid of your sins, we won't go over that anymore. We, there, there, in any step, there are five steps that you must take. Hear the gospel, Acts 15, 7. Believe it, same scripture. Then repent. Of your sins, Luke 13 and 3, and confess the name of Christ before men, and then be buried in the water of baptism, Father, remission of your sin. These are the steps that you have to take. But what these uh, false teachers do, a, a, a trickster, a gangster, religious gangster, he'll duck in there and get some of God's word and duck back out with it and fix it up, and, and that's what a thief will do. He must leave it in there and leave it like the Lord says. And you can't go in there and pick something out and fix it up and dress it up. You've got to stay and let it stay just like the Lord said. But some of them will take this and they take that. What they do, the plan of salvation, let me tell you this. What you must do to be saved cannot be found in no one verse in the New Testament. Any time a preacher said, this is all you have to do, give you that verse, he's a false teacher. Because the plan of salvation consists of a number of things. Somebody, well, well, well why? Uh, why? Like, like Paul, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He told the, the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the way these false teachers do. They said, that's what I tell sinners to do. Ain't said about no baptism. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's Bible. But what he's doing, he's doing violence to the scriptures because uh, the plan of salvation Salvation is not one step, it's a number of steps. It's a number of steps. And if you want to get one of those fellows who say, see, we don't fool with baptizing folk. Uh, the baptism don't have no power. In it. That's nothing to baptism. Water can't help you. It's just if you believe. And Paul said in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You say, you mean that's all I got to do? That's all. Just believe. You could ask him a question and knock him out. What's that? All I got to do is believe. Yes, just believe. That's what he said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You in your house. Said, so, well, do I have to repent? Quit my devil, man? He said, well, of course you've got to repent. Said, well, it didn't say that in that verse. Where you find that out? You just told me that all I have to do is that verse and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I asked you, do I have to repent? And you go and say, that's somewhere else. You see? That's the same way when we say if a man has to believe, it was a little short while, just, just, just wasn't very long, maybe possibly not even maybe an hour, that after, after this jailer believed, and he and his family, they went on and they were baptized that same hour of the night at midnight. That shows how important baptism is. That shows you right there that it was more to it and just believe. Now, you have to watch it. If you don't watch these false teachers, they are tricky. They'll pick a little bit out of the Bible and then uh, take it away and twist it around. Uh, uh, and, and when you get through, you really have not obeyed the Lord at all. These, the, the, there are several steps. You, and, uh, well, some people say, well, that's what confuses me. If he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when Paul said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, you know, that he is God's son, you'll be saved. Say, 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 I don't understand that. If he said, believe in you, you're saved. What you don't understand is that the plan of salvation, the steps that you must take to be saved, 
are not all found in one verse. There's no one verse that tells you all you have to do to be saved. Come on, y'all. They're looking funny on me on that. Uh, no, no, no. The plan of salvation in the New Testament is in the form of a synecdoche. I don't like to get in them things. I don't like to get into them, Brother Rob. But to understand a synecdoche uh, just simply means that it, it, it is a, it's a word that has more to it than it's mentioned. For example, these preachers, when they read where it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, they said, that's it. That's all of it. Didn't say anything about anything else. Well, suppose I told you that I went fishing and with a cane pole, I caught a 75-pound catfish with a cane pole. Do you think I meant cane pole only? That I yanked him out of there. And, no, when I said a uh, cane pole, it was understood that there was a hook on it, a line, a sink, and some bait. Oh, that was, when I said cane pole, it stood for all that other stuff. Am I right about it? Woman, oh, this cake is good. Tell the lady, said, how'd you make this cake? said, I made it out of, I, I, you may not believe it, I made it out of plain flour. Do you think she meant that she just got some plain flour, put it in a pan, and shoved it in the stove? I sure wouldn't want that cake. Is that right? Well, why did she say that? Uh, that other common sense is understood. All the other ingredients that go with it. And so through the New Testament, you'll find where people are told to be saved and it's given in a synecdoche form. The whole thing. The only way you can get the whole truth is stay within the law of Christ and get each case, about at least eight of them very clearly, each case where they were told what to do to be saved. And when you get through, guess what? Total them up. And there will be five things. You have to hear the gospel of Christ. You have to believe it. Then you have to repent. You have to confess. And then you have to be baptized. These are the steps. And they're in the, uh, in the synecdoche key form. But this is what you have to do. And praying is not even in the synecdoche key. <laughs> are you following me? You don't want to be an outlaw. Outlaw plans of salvation. Outlaw churches. There's but one church we read about in the New Testament, and that's the Church of Christ. Somebody said, well, what about the Church of God? He's God's son. Just one church. I challenge you. You read nothing about Methodist church, Baptist church. We got them. Well, now, where would you put a Baptist church? I'll challenge any man, if you're a preacher, come up here and put Baptist church within this circle. This circle is the law of Christ. Find the Baptist church within the law of Christ, within the New Testament. Find the word Baptist church in there. Can't find it. They come up with all kinds of things. Well, it, 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 it must be. The, no, it's not there. Baptist church, matter of fact, every denomination in this town and on the face of the earth is outside of the law of Christ. And what is a thing when it's religious outside the law of Christ? Well, that's what we've been talking about. That's iniquity. Any church but the church that you read about in the New Testament is an, is an outlaw church. How can you go to heaven in an outlaw church? That's pretty tough, isn't it? But that's the truth. That's the last night. I, I can go ahead on and say what I got to say. All right. Got plenty of gas in the car, bro. We're supposed to go tomorrow, but if we have to, we'll go on in tonight and stand around. So all I'm showing you, you just name it. The people are sincere. I feel sorry for the people. But those preachers ought to know better. But then there may be one sincere that doesn't. And if he is sincere, he'll see this. Always remember this. Within this circle is the law of Christ. The New Testament. New Testament. That's the law of Christ. Anything that you believe and practice you know, properly in the New Testament, the law will be pleased with it, and he'll own you at the judgment. Don't you step across the line and get outside of the law, because that'll make you an outlaw. And that's what iniquity is, operating outside of the law. And he's already saying, I mean, sound like a broken record. Each one of these cases, these people say, we did wonderful works in your name, all we did is in your name. He said, I never knew you. I never recognized you. I don't know you. 
And why? You've been working iniquity. Whatever you do, please, don't go up to the judgment with no iniquity. <laughs> Is that right? Well, I don't want, well, we have, it, as I said, we have iniquity, plans of salvation, and we have iniquity doctrines and churches. The only one you can find, as I said, in the New Testament is the Church of Christ. And, uh, and yet we must be very careful that we follow very closely what the New Testament teaches so that we will stay within uh, the uh, approval of Christ. Chapter and verse. They have iniquity worship. Nominated churches have iniquity worship. They worship God and they're using their instruments of music and whatnot. And you know, some people say, well, that's what I don't like about the Church of Christ. Uh, uh, David, he used instruments of music, but we're not under the, uh, under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Christ. And say, but, and I just don't see nothing wrong with it. Uh, and, and, but a piano, organ, any kind of instrument being used while we're singing, that's iniquity. That's iniquitous worship. That's outlaw worship. Why you say it's iniquity, Brother Brinkley? I say it's iniquity because it's out. He's a set sing. Every scripture that I can read of in the New Testament about the music of the church, Ephesians 5, 19, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Manishing one another in psalms and hymns and spirits, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Hebrews 2, 12, in the midst of the church, I will sing praises unto God. It's everywhere you're looking there, and the music is sing, sing, singing, sing, sing. That's within the law. But when you go to beating on drums and playing pianos and singing by these instruments, that's iniquity. That's outside of the law of Christ. Yes. Yes. I say, well, I just think that's too technical. So after all, uh, we have the organ and everything, the melodious sounds. It's, uh, it's not meant to just ignore what Christ said. It just makes the singing sound better. It's so dry and so dead, just singing. It makes it sound better. I'm going to give you some of Brother Keeble. I, you may have heard me. But this is the way Brother Keeble handles that. You mean to tell me you're going to inject instrumental music in the worship because uh, and you said it, it, just, it just makes it sound better, the singing sound better? Which one of you or which preacher in this town or any other town, denominational preacher, and when, when they do have the Lord's Supper, they should take it every Lord's Day, but... They don't, but when they do have it, I wonder what would happen if I was sitting close to the, uh, the, the, the table and when he gets ready to administer, he gets this bread and gets ready. And I said, just a minute. Uh, I got something here in my briefcase I'd like to help you out with. So what's that? I said, that bread, that communion bread, it's, it's kind of tasteless like. It's unleavened. It don't, don't have much taste to it. I said, but I got some good, a fresh country butter. If you let me spread a little of that on there, it sure will make that bread taste better. He said, well, no, you can't do that. I said, well, it'll make the bread taste better. That's what you say about the singing, that it ain't good enough. Piano make it, uh, make it sound better. You don't want me to use the butter the bread, but you want to, you know, play the piano. If it's wrong for me to butter the bread to make it taste better, it's wrong for you to piano, use the piano to make it sound better. Come on here now, you see that. If I can't butter his bread, he can't play the piano. Is that right? Don't, whenever the Bible says something, that's about church of Christ. We speak what the Bible speaks. We're silent what the Bible is silent. We, 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 we don't try to, try to make no apologies for what Christ said. Whatever he says, we're going to do it. If that's what he wants is singing, give him what he asks for. Put anything with it, you're stepping across the line and getting in iniquity. Worst thing you can go up to the judgment with on you is iniquity. Hmm, my time. Iniquity worship, iniquity churches, iniquity plans of salvation, all of these things will give you trouble. Trouble at the judgment. If you want to get away from iniquity, then you take the step that the Lord gave. Simple, as we said, five simple steps. Each one of them, hear the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins. And repent means to quit your devil, man. If you've been lying, quit it. If you've been gambling, quit it. It means put it down. Preacher one time, uh, he was a denominational preacher. And I'm not, not trying to just put them down, just to be putting them down. But this particular preacher, and I wouldn't say that others are, are like him. But this guy, he was talking about 
tell his sinners to come and repent. Now, that, that, that's correct. You got to repent. That, that's, that's within the law. Except you repent, you perish. But he, he tried to explain it. He tried to explain it, Brother Shad. He said, now, here's where repentance is. It means if you've been lying, quit it. Gambling, quit it. Stealing, quit it. He said, like you take myself. I used to gamble, I used, and I was bad about running women. And he said, when I used to gamble, I quit it. When I was drinking, I quit it. And I was running women, and I'm quitting that. Wait, 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 wait. Something happened there. Does repentance mean quitting or quit? You got to quit. All right. <laughs> so you must do them, just as it said, repent. Confess the name of Christ before men. And then go down in the water of baptism. The water is ready. We are ready. Heaven is waiting. And you need to take care of that. If you stubbornly go on and say, well, I'm going on with my way and with my church. Okay. Uh, anything outside of the law of Christ is iniquity. The church of Christ, the name church of Christ is not iniquity. Romans 16, 16, Paul says, salute one another with the Holy Ghost. The churches of Christ salute you. In the churches of Christ, all of our worship on the Lord's day is right down the line. We have these five items of worship. We have singing without the use of instrumental music. We have prayer. Everybody prays, but only the men can lead the prayers. First Timothy 2 8. I would that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And so the prayer, everybody prays, but only the men lead. Because sometimes you tell people that I don't let you. A woman can't pray in that church. Well, all of us are supposed to be praying. We have our heads bowed, but all don't lead. Just like this brother McDaniel, he does a beautiful job leading the song. We're all singing, but we're not all leading it. Is that right? We're all praying. All Christians pray, but only the men can take the lead. And as long as the Lord's church is sound, you will not find a woman in the pulpit either. There are women who are pastoring churches, so to speak. Ministers of churches. A woman preacher is an outlaw preacher. That's iniquity. Why? Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, I suffer not a woman to teach other usurp authority over the man, but to be in subjection. Let your women keep silent in the church. It's not permitted for them to speak, but to be in silence. If they want to know anything, let them ask their husband at home. He said, for it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. As far as Christ is concerned, it's a shame for a woman to be in the pulpit. Now, how can she be in the pulpit leading a flock of people and doing what's a shame? She's going to have trouble at the judgment. She's full of iniquity and loading the members down with it. Whew. It's tough, isn't it? So if you don't want to be surprised at the judgment, you better make sure that everything you do, Church of Christ is within this circle, name, we wear the doctrine we, we preach. Everything that we do is within the circle. And every now and then when we find one in here acting up and want to try to do in the circle what they're doing outside the circle, we have to withdraw from them if they don't repent. Amen. Is that right? We got to stay. If we want to go to heaven, we, 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 anything outside of this, if you're in here and ain't acting right, and you be isolated so you won't cor cor corrupt us. Because I don't want to be up there with no iniquity on me. Amen. You? Oh, don't, okay. All right. Let me say one more thing. These kind of things that I'm talking about now, they are aimed at good, sincere religious people who are in churches working in them. And I want you to know that these churches were started by men, and it's a direct conflict with Jesus Christ. He did not intend for anybody to have a church but himself. On this rock I build my church, gates of hell shall not prevail against it. These men have started these different churches. Have you seen lately how the Pope is coming all around and loving dealing with people and, and everybody's all right and everything? Well, you know what? They call himself the father of the faith, father in the church. That, uh, that's, he, he's an outlaw father. <laughs> is that right? That's iniquity. Why? Because what did the Bible say about it, brother? Call no man what? your father on this earth. Well, there's one father, and that's God. He is in heaven. Well, if the Pope calls himself father, he is an outlaw father. Outside of the Lord Christ. No man can call himself the father of the church and stay within the circle. Is that right? Outlaw father. And they have a lot of outlaw doctrine. 
But since my time is about gone, I want to make one other observation about uh, a surprise at the judgment. There are going to be some people surprised at the judgment in this respect. Naturally, people don't even believe in the Bible, nothing like that. They're going to be shocked. I thought that started, I thought it's never did take that Bible was right. That's the way they were in the days of Noah. Noah preached all those years, 120 years, God waited, and the people act like that Noah wouldn't even exist. They just ignored him. And Jesus brought it up. He said, as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. They were marrying and giving in marriage, just going on doing their thing, so to speak, until the flood was on them. And there are a lot of people, not all tangled up in different denominations so much. You're just your own thing. You're doing your thing. Well, you can't do your thing and go to heaven. You've got to do the Lord's thing. You've got to surrender, surrender to the law of Christ, enter his church, and start living in there according to his law. If not, you're going to be in iniquity. You just can't get there messing around on the outside. I just say, well, it's pretty tough. Let me tell you something. This is my last thought. Not only are a lot of good, sincere people who don't know no better, and the preachers won't tell them any better, going to be shocked at the judgment, charged with iniquity because they're operating outside of God's law. There are some people is going to get a shock before the judgment. The judgment is the full-fledged shock. But they're going to get shocked before the judgment, they are going to get shocked as soon as they die. As soon as the blood stops running in their veins, as soon as they die, they're going to get a shocking that they can't do anything about but just take the misery that goes with it. Then they're going to the final judgment. What are you talking about, Brother Brink? Can I say a word or two about that, Chad? Because uh, a lot of people say, well, they're they not too religious. They, 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 they. They're they not uh, much involved in none of the different churches. They're just doing their own thing. Well, I, I'll be all right. They think, they think that uh, at least they get a reprieve. When people, if they're halfway in their right mind and take their own life and stuff like that, uh, they, they, they think that, uh, oh, well, especially things are hard on me. It's like the, the walls are closing in on them and everything's coming down on them. They say, oh, I, know, I, just, I just can't take this no more. And they take a gun or something, blow their brains out, jump in the river, drown, anything. They do. You know why they do that? They think that, they, they mistake what they see. When they see people stretched out in death in their caskets, and they look at they, they look so peaceful and so calm. And it's looked like, at least for now, their worries are gone. I just had to get away. Well, let me tell you one thing. If you die, Outside of Christ's church, faithful in Christ's church, if you die outside of his church and not even in any denomination, you're going to get shocked. Right after you die, you're going to get a shocking. And what is that? You will discover that though your body uh, is relaxed, you don't, don't, don't go along that body. The worst criminal in the world, in a casket stretched out there, he can look so peaceful. He ain't peaceful. Because when that soul leaves the body, in the 16th chapter of the book of Luke, Jesus told what goes on. When the soul leaves the body, there is a place, an unseen world, where all of the souls go. The righteous and the unrighteous. They all go to this place. As soon as you die, you committed suicide, or you, or you, you robbed somebody, and killed in the robbing and all like that. Somebody said, well, he, at least he's, he's, he's sleeping. Oh, no, no, no. What happens? You know anything? Especially if you're done right, you're going to wake up and find yourself in a place hot, burning. 16th chapter of the book of Luke tell you about that. Uh, and it's some kind of place, too. I tell you what it kind of reminds me of, but the illustration is short-lived. But it's sort of like if you were to go to a big fancy restaurant, you know. In this big fancy restaurant, everything protocol is so, so up and up. You don't just go breaking in there and get you a seat. Uh, there's someone there to uh, greet you and, and wait on you and ask you about where you want to sit. They might say, uh, uh, 
smoking or no smoking section. I'll tell you what, when you die unfaithful to God or in sin, uh, it's going to be two places. A smoking section and a no smoking section. And you're not going to be asked which one you want. <laughs> Is that right? You're going to have to go there uh, in that smoking section where you will be tormented. Constantly tormented. And everything that you got, all of your feelings, everything. You got everything. You can see, you can feel, you can talk. And if you're in that miserable place, if you went over there with iniquity on you, all of that, you'll be uh, tied up in that and can't get away from it. Ain't no rest for the wicked. Ain't no way you can go there. No, no, no. If you think so, here's some people going to be shocked and already have been shocked. You got to do something about that place. And I tell you what, in that uh, case when Jesus was on the cross, and you know, and this one of these men repented that sinful thief, he says, remember me when you go into your kingdom. Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And we know that happened because Jesus promised it. Well, in this place, this unseen world, it's got, like I said, two parts. This smoking section, no smoking section. We got a place of peace where you are conscious and you're there, but you're on the side with the Lord and you have nothing to worry about. But all others, they're on the side with the devil. Uh, and on that devilish side, and you're talking about misery, suffering, and pain, you are going to have it. You can't, and you can't get away. And, and so you don't, and don't, 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 whatever you do, don't think you can rush yourself out. Just get away from it all. Boom. Do something like that. You just, you, you in for a surprise. You don't find yourself there. You can see. Abraham, and I think Lazarus was the one that was faithful to God and the rich man saw him. He could see down there. And the rich man was in misery. And uh, he asked Lazarus, uh, let Lazarus just come and dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue. Everything he had you know, uh, in the world, he doesn't have his body, but he could see, he could feel, he could taste, he could talk. All that's going on after he's passed from this life. You, 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 you be surprised. Oh, I didn't know it was like this. Oh, you better die right. Because if you don't, the very minute you die, you're going to start suffering. And that's not the eternal suffering. You got to go to the judgment for that. But you suffer until the Lord sees fit to call an end to this world and you're brought into the judgment. Ain't no way you can get away from it. See what? And you know what I've done? If there's somebody like this here tonight, it ain't, I ain't for church. You just, it ain't my thing. you just going on. And if I die, I die. You need to know. You in for a shop if you think you're just going to sleep till judgment day. Because that place exists. Yes, it does. And Jesus told that thief, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that wasn't heaven. It was a place of peace, like a garden, a place of rest and comfort. That's where the righteous go. If you stay within the law of Christ and die faithful in the Lord's church and the Lord Christ, you will go to that place of comfort and rest till the day of judgment. And the wicked may see you, the denominational people may see you, but you, they can't come to you and you can't go to them. There's a gulf fix. You can't come to the other. You just have to stay there if you are wicked and then be happy if you are righteous. What a place you, can, you have to go so then uh, iniquity can rob you of all of those blessings. And so that uh, somebody said, well, I just thought like the Jehovah Witness said, when you're dead, you're done. When you're dead, you're like Rover. Dead all over. Uh-uh, that, that ain't like Rover. No, 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 no. And let me say this in, in conclusion. This, this is an awesome and a terrifying thing to think. That rich man, he had all that, but he was too selfish to give Lazarus. And all Lazarus wanted was a few crumbs. He didn't ask the rich man for no T-bone steaks. Just the crumb. Rich man, his disposition was awful. Somebody said, well, I'm glad I'm not rich. The thing that sent this rich man to this place was not his riches. It was not his riches. 
It was not his position. It was his disposition. And the poorest man in the world ain't got a dime can have a bad disposition. Lanyon hell. Y'all looking at me funny. You know, I mean, they've been saying, some have been saying, well, Brother Brinkley, don't stop. You know, just keep on. I believe you kind of want me to stop now. <laughs> so, you need to get right. And the plan is simple. We've given it to you. Those steps are simple. They're profound. Hear how Christ died for your sins. Believe it with all your heart. Yeah. Repent of your sin. Yeah. Turn from wrong to right. Yeah. Repentance is like a U-turn. What you do when you run say a U-turn? I mean, you got to turn the whole way around. If you're willing to repent and confess the name of Christ before men, we'll ask you, do you believe in all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Everything we ask you to do, every step you take will be according to the law of Christ. And if you confess that you believe he's the Son of God, we'll take you and bury you in baptism. The same hour of the night, when you come up out of the water of baptism, all of your sin will be washed away. And we will no longer be considered an outlaw, but a faithful servant of God. Would you like that tonight? Would you like to be a part of that number? If you've been in here and you've been bringing disgrace upon the family, you need to do something about that. Because if you're not faithful to the Lord, then he said you're like a dog that returned to his own vomit. That's the way the Lord sees members of the church. You get in here and after a while you start doing some of that same old stuff you did out there in the world. You gambling, drinking, and all these other kind of things, and, and fornicating and all that. And you better quit that because the Bible teaches that when you do that, you're like a dog that returns to his own vomit. Whew. Dog eats something, make him sick. He said, Ooh, must have been pretty bad. He couldn't hold it down. Well, that's bad enough, but if you don't watch him, he'll go back to that. Woo, and you talk about it. Reading that filth. You say, well, oh, Brother Brinkley, don't talk. That's too. Well, Peter one brought it up. He said, a man, go back, you know, after he's been washed, he's like a sow been washed and go back to the mouth, all like a dog that vomits, then eats his own vomit. That's what a member of the church looks like. In here now and eating your own vomit, doing the same stuff in here that you did out in the world. Your punishment is going to be worse. And it would have been if you never got in. Amen. And but it's going to be bad enough if you never get in. He yes, said, well, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm glad you told it like it is, preacher. You didn't, you didn't take no shortcuts. You just told me like it was. I got to stand in the judgment. For, I got to give an account for what I preach. There's a man that's in the church now, one of our fine brothers. And guess what one of the things, I didn't know it, that impressed him more and, and, and helped him to obey the God. You heard me say one Sunday, said, I, try, I believe I'm preaching the truth. If I'm not preaching the truth, you all, any of y'all know, if I'm wrong in anything, show me, because I don't want to be lost. I got to give an account of what I preach. And if I'm wrong, show me. He said, that man, must, that man mean right. And that's what we mean tonight. Yes. Is there someone here that needs to come forward and ask the church to forgive you? That's the law of Christ. And if you're not a member, we've given you the steps over and over again. You can do them tonight. If you don't fully understand the steps, come right on up and, 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 and tell Brother Chad. Said, it's one of them things I miss. What is it, Brother Chad? And guess what? He's going to tell you the same thing that I tell him. That's right. That's why Chad said in the beginning of this meeting uh, that uh, the way we operate, Chad is a white brother and I'm a black brother. But I tell you what about that. Chad knows what that is about that gospel. That gospel of Christ, and when you get it in black and white, you sure enough got it. <laughs> Is that right? So I know it's right, I got it in black and white. If you're here tonight, willing to come, won't you do so while we stand and sing? Will you be free from the